And that seems to be, um, in ordinary circumstances, a reasonable way to approach it, that you identify the problems and then seven months later, when the, the, the budget is next year, you deal with the problem. But, Phil, it seems to be a, a, a fairly casual timetable in a budget emergency. I guess the actions don't match the pre-election rhetoric. You know, like, you know, they need to hit the ground running from day one and save the budget. But it is, a, it is as you said, a methodical staged approach by hockey. A, identify the problem, um, you know, find all the spiders and so forth, and then set about uh, fixing it. I think we're where Labor has a gripe is that he has spent money since the election and, and the $9 billion grant to the Reserve Bank, that one-off grant, which took a forecast $30 billion deficit for this financial year to 40. Now, we're expecting a deficit for this financial year to be somewhere between 40 and 45 by the time of the, um, they released this mid-year economic statement just after Christmas. And I think we'll... Hockey is saying he's going to blame Labor for all that. Well, he can really only blame Labor probably for the $30 billion, and anything since then is his. Yeah, so, you, you say that Labor has a gripe on that. Let's hear from uh, Chris Bowen and then uh, uh, the economist uh, Stephen Kukoulos. Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey campaigned on the platform of reducing the budget deficit. Since the election, all they've done is blow the budget deficit. And they have shown us their values and priorities by giving higher income earners a bigger tax break on superannuation while insisting, insisting on scaling back the tax concessions for low and middle income workers. We're still on track for a surplus in a couple of years' time uh, and we just simply don't have a budget emergency at all. We never really did have one. If anything, they've actually added to this year's deficit by giving the Reserve Bank $8.8 .8 billion and not really doing much to cut waste. They're waiting for their audit commission in a few months' time before they do anything. So presumably this waste will continue until they actually see what the audit commission comes up with. So I guess it's a question. You're saying they're trying to load all this onto, on, onto Labor so that when they get to May they'll be claiming the whole thing. And they'll need currency to... Labor's yeah. legacy. Yeah, yeah. basically. And, and they're, look, they're going to have to do some murderously unpopular things in the May budget. If Abbott has committed them to get back to surplus, he says, at least as soon as Labor said they would, which is 2016-17. He's promised a strong surplus, which is 1% of GDP, which is about $15 billion in today's terms, within a decade. He's also promised within a decade to restore defence funding to 2% of GDP, possibly deliver tax cuts and, and abolish the means test on the private health rebate. Now, that's a lot of money they've got to find in uh, over the next three to ten years. Especially if you're scrapping taxes. As you're scrapping taxes, as the mining boom is, is coming to an end, as the government is now talking about bringing forward borrowing to, to fund infrastructure to try and stimulate the post-boom depression. So it's an enormously ambitious timetable they're setting themselves well, Stephen out. Stephen Kukulis just said there that um, they were still on track for a well, it was a according to the figures, but we're going to we're really. It, I think you know, uh, hockey's really going to own the economy from the May budget onwards, and it's going to have to be a fairly ambitious document. The politics in the meantime, though, Dennis, um, it, it's um, sensible enough, I guess, to, to to make some of the changes now that could be loaded onto on, onto Labor's legacy. Blame them for that, and then make the improvements from May. Yeah, it's pretty clear what they're what they're setting out to do, and and um, uh, Joe Hockey is you know he's out there prosecuting the case. I think quite quite well in in political terms. Terms. You know, he is loading all this up on Labor. Labor are absolutely furious about it. You, you know, they, they, they criticise it in public, but in private they're screaming and yelling and throwing bricks at their televisions. <laughs> um, you know, they, because they can see exactly what's going on. Uh, the, the, the government judges, and I think probably quite correctly, that everything they say about uh, the state of the books between now and the budget, they can easily blame on Labor and they can say, look, this is the, the, you know, the spiders we found in the cupboard, this is a mess. Uh, but and most then, of it is. And, and most, most of it is, uh, but you know, the numbers, as Phil has said, have, have been pumped up quite a bit uh, by the government, uh, with some, you know, they've, they've, they've got justification for doing that. Uh, there's arguments about whether that justification is valid or not. But I think that the most interesting thing from what Joe Hockey said was, he said, in May, we will provide the solution. That's mm. a big test. Mm. I mean, the solution is not just a, a stepping stone. The solution is fixing Le what they say was uh, Labor's reckless spending and, and bad economic management. Uh, now, if they're going to do that in their first budget, that is a big ask. But there are still signs of precariousness in the economy, too. I mean, you also heard Joe Hockey saying, 
in the meantime, I want people to go out and spend for Christmas. They're still worried about confidence. They're still mm. worried about the retail sector. There's a mm. suggestion they may have to stimulate the economy in the budget. We may see another round of stimulus, kind of like the Labor government did, building infrastructure, having to inject some money into the economy, and things choking around. And there's no sign that the, the revenue problems, which are now looking pretty well structural, mm. uh, are, are, are solving themselves. You know, the, the, the revenue shortfalls that we've seen come time and time again over the last 18 months, they don't look like they're stopping. Joe Hockey said that the revenue is still deteriorating. What, 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 they, what they are trying to do is they're trying to build political currency between now and the budget to do the things they're going to tell us in the budget. And, that's, and this commission of audit is going to recommend some things which people aren't going to like and the government's going to adopt them. Now, Hockey has said if we haven't ruled them... away, or would they do? If, if their well, tax changes, they might take them to the next election. Well, what, yeah, well, what, what they're going to do, this thing Dennis was talking about, is the sort of the, the solution. It's, they're going to call it a roadmap. That's the word they've been using. Mm -hmm. So they may adopt measures for which they don't have a mandate, but they'll be in the out years of next year's budget, which will put it beyond the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, look, we need you to vote for us again in 2016 to give us a mandate to do this. This is the roadmap back to surplus. Warming people up to the idea. Yeah, so that's, that, that's, that's, the sort, that's, that's the strategy. Here. Did anything surprise you about the tax initiatives that they, some they threw out, some they adopted, but uh, with the superannuation changes in particular where the, the, the low income earners missed out on, a, on mm. a benefit that was coming their way and the high income earners retained one. Well, look, it was a bad look on super because they're going, as part of abolishing the mining tax, they're getting rid of measures that were supposedly funded by, and in a couple of cases they're whacking you know, low and middle income earners, they're deferring the increase of 9 to 12 per cent for two years, and they're getting rid of the low income super contribution, right? So it all mm. affects sort of workers. At the same time, they said we cannot proceed with this tax on earnings over $100,000, so these are for people who've got two million and more in their super funds on the basis it's complex to administer. That was the excuse they used. Now, Labor mm. says that's rubbish. Bowen says that's nonsense. He was the Treasurer. The government says it's not nonsense. If they're right or wrong, it's still a bad look. I think they sort of, you know, ease off on somebody's super and go after someone else's, and it, that, that was an unfortunate uh, perception. It's a bit curious from a government that's so obsessed with rhetoric management and mm. perception that they didn't seem to have a good way of dealing with the perception of that, which was at, you know, at both ends the, the low-income people were being hit. Now, Karen, on the uh, we'll go back to the Indonesian story and the and the standoff has now been resolved. Was it though um, the part of the problem for the government was the timing that they that they chose um, um, to take Indonesia on over a, a political matter, really, in the in the end at a time when the spying thing was so raw. Yeah, and I think um, the other thing is that all of these issues are in close proximity to the presidential election in Indonesia next year. And you have to look at all of this through the prism of that. Now, Marty Natalagawa, the Indonesian foreign minister, is not a candidate, but he will be positioning to look for a job under the new government, under whoever is president. So the rhetoric is really being ramped up on both of these things. That's not to say they don't actually care about them. They do. If you look at the rhetoric that our current government uses, Used through the election campaign, they are now following through with that and trying to manage uh, policy to, to match the rhetoric. And I think the Indonesians will do the same. So you can't just dismiss it as political rhetoric that will disappear after the election. I, I think it's, it's a potential problem. Is this the permanent position from Indonesia now, Dennis, so they won't take these boats back? Well, I, I think it's going to be... They, they will play harder and harder hardball with it and with the Australian uh, authorities on this. And, and now they've, they've sort of got the, the issue of spying mixed up in it. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the first things Marty Nadalungawa said was, uh, well, why should we share intelligence with Australia? They seem, uh, you know, sort of so good at sort of <laughs> listening to what we're doing. Uh, let them find out by themselves. So he's sort of conflated the two things of, of boat people and, and spying. Um, and I, I think it will be a problem for Australia all the way through the presidential election. I think the Australians also have to think about the fact that the current government in Indonesia is the most Australian friendly government that uh, that we've had in Indonesia since uh, the ref uh, since the reforms came in in the late 90s. Uh, now the next government may not be so friendly and, and if these issues get caught up in the campaign uh, then this relationship could become much more difficult next year. And it's genuinely unclear who the next president will be. There isn't an obvious next president and there is some concern in Australia about the shape of that relationship even without all of this. But problem. where's public sympathy on this though back here in Australia? I mean uh, uh, there'd be, uh, I would have thought a, a, 
Uh, many Australians would support Tony Abbott on this and standing up to the Indonesians. Mm. And the, he said yesterday that, well, we would never allow boats to leave Australia for Indonesia and virtually saying to the Indonesians, well, you, sh you shouldn't do... Well, that's the a line he used when he was in Indonesia. He said, your sovereignty is important, but so is ours. Mm. And, um, and uh, um, yeah, but the point is they're not going from Australia to Indonesia, they're coming the other way. Look, I think, you know, boats was a huge issue in the election. The voters still want to have them stopped. I think this is probably too premature to say Abbott's lost the war on this. It's a battle lost, definitely. It's been a shocking mm. week for Scott Morrison on, on that front and for the government on the issue, but it, it, it may not be the bigger, the bigger picture. But it's, oh, the Dennis is right. If the nationalists win the elections in Indonesia, this will become a permanent, <laughs> permanent mm. fixture. And we should not be surprised at this. I mean, the uh, SBY's regime has been saying to their blue in the face for the last year in the whole lead up to the Australian election, we're not going to let you turn boats back. I mean, yeah. no matter, they said it a thousand different ways. And when Kevin Rudd went to Jakarta, you know, SBY stood up with him present and, and you know, talked about that unilateralism. You deliberately said, we're not going to let you do it. So, you know, it's, it is a problem that's best managed behind the scenes. And with this spy thing, it's just, you know, it's thrown out. It, it, it's, it's just become a mess. But I don't yeah. think, I, at the moment, it looks like an aberration, but there's a danger it could become. Permanent. And you mentioned that Scott Morrison's had a, a shocking week as well, and, and Laurie Oates talked about his arrogance. But it goes sort of beyond that as well. Um, we'll show you the moment now where Scott Morrison was um, um, asked by journalists about reports that there were a couple of uh, unaccompanied minors on Manus Island. He had this to say. Minister, with regards to the two unaccompanied minor children being held on Manus Island, are you aware of who that legal guardian is? Well, again, you're suggesting someone is on Manus Island. Are there unaccompanied minors on Manus Island or Nauru? My understanding there are no accompanied minors on Manus Island. And then, of course, he put out a statement saying, well, there are a couple of... Um, so not only has he ridiculed journalists, but he's getting it wrong a couple mm. of... This is the second time, I think, that he's done that in recent briefings. I can't see how this situation is sustainable, really. Even from Scott Morrison's point of view, if he wants to inject himself into the debate at periods through the week, he can't do it because he's tied himself to this weekly briefing. Even from his point of view, I can't see that it's a good idea to only stick to one week, once a week. But you can't keep getting things wrong and trying to fix it up by press release later. It's not, it's not an acceptable way to operate and you can't sneer at journalists who are asking appropriate questions on behalf of the rest of the public. And also, uh, when he has, a, I think it's disappointing to see a man in uniform as well, um, sort of folding himself into this process. Um, as you saw earlier, um, he was actually refusing to answer questions even before he heard the question. Um, yes. And uh, it's uh, the, these people who in, 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 um, uh, who high, hold high offices in. Uh, in the military, work very hard at their at their public relations, and you only need a, somebody like this to bring the whole yeah, thing down. Yeah, well, he's, he's under orders. People he? in yeah. uniform take orders from politicians, yeah, and that's yeah. what he was doing. And maybe he was executing his orders a little bit enthusiastically in that case. But that's yeah, what they I think do. hear the question before you you know whether it applies to uh, what's the term, Dennis? Matters on um, water. On or water matters. Yes. On water matters. On water transfers. <laughs> um, uh, David Johnson, of course, the defence minister, went to uh, Jakarta and, uh, and and didn't give a news conference. That seems to be a sensitive issue in Indonesia as well. Because it's the second time that's happened now that the mm. Indonesian journalists have got questions. In this case it was over the spying allegations they wanted to raise with him um, and his uh, response on that was that that's a matter for the foreign ministers to sort out. Mm. Yes and apparently in uh, Jakarta a, a number of people still think that Stephen Smith's the defence minister so <laughs> maybe he should sort of front up out there and say you know he, 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 here I am and I'm, my name is um, uh, um, David Johnson. David Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, the media strategy is getting a, a bit of attention, so let's hear now from uh, Tony Abbott and Julie Bishop on that. It's more important to be involved in governing our country than it is simply to be giving endless interviews, uh, which are all about glorifying politicians rather than about doing the right thing by the people of Australia. Yes, we will speak when we need to speak. We will act when we need to act. But we won't speak for the sake of speaking and we won't bung on things just for the purposes of a PR gesture because that's not good government. That's a form of political exhibitionism. My challenge to the media is next time I do a press conference with my friend and colleague Dr Natalie Gower Ask me about one of the 50 or 60 areas of deep cooperation rather than the one or two areas where we are having a discussion where we might disagree, yet we are both resolved 
to ensure that there is no problem between our two countries. Okay, what do you make of that? We won't speak for the sake of speaking anymore. And it's not good government, but it's good opposition. So everything's changed now that we've won office. We don't have to talk anymore. But nobody's suggesting they, they, they um, be a carbon copy of the, the no. previous government. Oh, look, but, it'd be, but it's just a question of being accountable and, and being available when issues it. arise. Yeah. Look, oh. from a personal perspective, I've had, I've had, I haven't had a problem with the government on the, the, this front. I mean, I had an interview with Tony Abbott a week or so ago. And, and actually, had a, I had an interview with him the day before the election where he said he was going to shut the whole thing down if he got in. So it's not like the, you know, this wasn't coming. But at the, I think, yeah, if it starts getting in the way of accountability when there's stuff that needs to be asked or answered or there's genuine questions and we're either getting the Friday follies or, or nothing at all. All right, so they're looking after you. So you will, well, ask, Julie, no, no, no. You'll ask Julie Bishop about all those positive no, issues not, the next time. No, I was looking after me, but I'm fine. I, I, I'm managing to work around it or through it, or, and, and others are too. I don't sense a great deal of complaint from my colleagues, to be honest, uh, in, yeah, in I my don't, office. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking the heat out of the debate. I mean, it got to feral levels earlier this year. The whole political debate was... Off, off the rails, and so it's good to to slow that down a little bit. But, but there is a question of accountability. I mean, when we were with Tony Abbott at APEC in Bali, and the entitlements issue came up, there were questions to be asked. He kept on deflecting them at a news conference, saying, "Oh, I'm here to talk about APEC. I'll take those questions later." Time was marching on, and he was getting ready to walk out the door, and we had to say, "Look, Prime Minister, I'm sorry, we do want to ask you about these questions. You are still Prime Minister yeah. when you're overseas." And Phil, there is a difference between giving a newspaper interview and then going on the record on videotape yeah. and, and, yeah. and it's, screwing it's it up. It's frustrating. You've got a defence minister like David Johnson who, quite frankly, mm. would struggle, wouldn't he, to, to deal with a 10 well, or 12 minute interview? I guess so. I don't, I don't know him at all. But I mean, the point being is just, I think. Neither do the Indonesians. No, no. But when there's questions to be asked, I think you've got to put yourself up. Tony Abbott, in that speech in Perth yesterday, gave the impression that it's only for PR purposes you, you do an interview. That's wrong. It's yeah, not. There's times I agree. when. when when you need to and look, he, he gave a doorstop on Friday, Abbott. He gave a press conference down in Melbourne, really about nothing. I think he may be getting a bit sensitive, but he took questions on a whole range of things, from grain court to the carbon tax and stuff. If you do that every now and then, you know, you'll be okay. Yes, I Dennis. Think that's right. I, I, I think there's a, a, a for me, a, a bigger issue here uh, than, than accountability, as important as that is. There's also the the question of whether or not the government is having a conversation with the public, whether or not the public is hearing what the government's story is, what, what we've, we've called in recent years the narrative. Um, you know, the, the public needs to be taken into the confidence of a government so that when a time comes, and it may come from something that happens inside the government or it may come from some sort of external event, when the time comes for the, for the public to call on the, the, the... for the government to call on the public for support over something, you don't have to sort of reintroduce yourself. And I just think this government has, has been a bit shy, with I think the possible exception of Joe Hockey, they've been a bit shy in explaining exactly what they're doing as the new government. OK, now on the Grain Corps issue, and it is a tough one to come, Warren Truss went on the program uh, last Sunday and was quite public um, in his uh, arguments uh, against the sale of Grain Corps to American interests. That uh, clearly offended some Liberals who feel the debate should be held in-house, and then Joe Hockey um, at a news conference said this. Let me say this on foreign investment. I will not be bullied or intimidated by anyone when it comes to dealing with the national interest. Anyone. 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 So specifically on Grain Corps? Uh, anyone. Thanks very much. I think there's only one conclusion to make out of that comment. He feels he's being bullied by the Deputy Prime Minister, or perhaps it's by the Agriculture Minister, Mr Joyce. Uh, we clearly have a, a government at war with itself on this issue. For the Deputy Prime Minister to try and publicly shame the Treasurer into a decision and for the Treasurer to publicly respond in a press conference by saying he won't be bullied shows these deep divisions. Phil? Well, it is extraordinary, isn't it, when you, when you, when you boil it down to that? I mean. Warren Truss on this show last week was absolutely out of the blocks on it and, 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 and completely unambiguous about where he stood and the whole National Party is rock solid. Well, more view. than that, though, uh, it's, it's, it's not so much national versus liberal, it's country well, versus country, city. Well, country, though, say the rah as well, the rural liberals well, as well. Russell Broadbent, for example, I now one. know, um, is um, opposed to the sale, mm. and a liberal, and mm. I think Sharman Stone, maybe Bill Heffern, and there are others, so mm. it's, a, it's, it's more a country liberal thing, a uh, country yeah, yeah, city. Yeah, the rural and regionals, the rah mm. as they call them, and, and, it, and it is... And it, and it is 
And no one's backing off. I mean, if anything, the sentiment is starting is starting to grow. And hockey has a real dilemma here. You know, you, do you split the party or do you do you make good that slogan about being open for business? And I noticed on Friday both Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott in separate press conferences mentioned, I think, Wayne Swan uh, knocking back the takeover of the stock exchange by the Singaporeans, mm. um, saying, oh, this has been done before. So, yep. uh, And also someone to me mentioned Chinalco as well, uh, the Chinalco bid, which Swan knocked back. Uh, to now country. and someone's also mentioned Shell knock, uh, Peter Costello, Costello blocking. Well, maybe they the are Shell's. softening up. So, for, so th backing away. They're, 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 well, I don't know. They're not at a decision yet, but their precedents are still where these things have been knocked but, back. But are sitting liberals are, are basically biting their tongues on this and mm. staying out of the public debate, but not so former liberals. Here's Peter Reith. Now they talk about food security. For heaven's sakes, we pr we produce a huge amount of food. Is there anybody seriously saying there's going to be a shortage of food in Australia? I mean, honestly, where do they make you know where do they get some of these arguments from? That'll please the nationals. <laughs> um, okay, now Parliament sits on Tuesday, and um, the, the, the real business will get underway, I guess, on on Wednesday. I'm sure the, the government's main <coughs> weapon will be carbon tax. Maybe Labor's will be the budget emergency that n doesn't any longer seem to exist. Be a bit of boats too, I yeah. think. You know, I think Labor yeah. will have a bit of fun with the boats. Why wouldn't they? I mean, you know, it's there for them. So. Yep. Yeah. And, and what about this call from Tony Abbott for, um, you know, just let's calm things down a bit now. We've, uh, that's what the public's ready for. Yes, he wants a cur more courteous parliament. Doesn't want the, what did he say, the circuits that has been around before. We'll see how he, go he goes with that. Um, I think the Labor side is also going to talk about you're not getting the... I mean, they started doing this already. You're not getting the Tony Abbott you voted for, that things are not the same as they were, that he was out and talking all the time and now he's secretive and this is a different kind of Tony Abbott. So they're trying to position politically on that point as well. And on the carbon tax, will there be a vote before Christmas? Doesn't it? Will the government be anxious to, um, to have a vote before Christmas so that they can then go back to it early next year and get a double dissolution trigger? Well, I think the government will be anxious to have a vote before Christmas, but uh, the feeling you get from Labor is that they're in no hurry. They want to shine a light on the, on the government's direct action policy as much as possible uh, and put off a vote until uh, um, early next year. So I think they'll try and move for a, an inquiry and, and, and try and uh, get the legislation, uh, not so much the repeal part of the legislation, but what the government intends to do, get that before a committee and, and expose it as mm. much as they can. Yeah, yeah, both, both sides seem to see this as to their political benefit to drag this out. Labor and the, and the coalition said, OK, drag it out the, the longer the better, because they see this as suicide by Labor. Both sides have, uh, uh, think they're doing the right thing. Uh, the, the only added pressure on Tony Abbott on the government is the business community. If this thing's going to be knocked off, they want it knocked off now. They don't want a retrospective legislation with the new Senate after July 1, because that's going to just cause enormous problems and complexity. And whether or not uh, getting rid of the carbon tax means electricity prices will go down is another debate that will come up. Here's uh, Greg Hunt. Once the carbon tax is removed, electricity prices will be lower by the amount of the carbon tax. On average, for families, that's 9%. What we found is that about 70% of companies have, have absorbed the carbon tax, so there's not a lot to pass back to consumers. Prices will come down and certainly be less than what they would have been if not for the carbon tax. Did those good guys in business really absorb the um, the impact or was the impact not very much at all? Well, I don't know. I mean, Ennis Willix is from the Australian Industry Group. Most of his, his members would have been hit by it, you know, um, Manufacturer. manufacturers, industry, right. you know, stuff like that. So, don't know, but I guess the Perhaps point... Perhaps too small to, to bother about. They absorbed it and so now they won't be passing it back. Yeah, or it was unprofitable to pass it on or they had the capacity to absorb it or whatever. But the... the up the industry group, the business council, the energy suppliers are all saying that they don't expect a big pass-through, it was the term. And yet the ACCC costs. is still insisting that it will. Mm. Oh, the ACCC and the government will be, uh, will be on their backs mm. watching that one very closely. Mm. All right, more with our panel shortly with Karen Middleton, with Phil Curry and Dennis Atkins, but now it's time for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. Mike Bowers, and I'm Director of Photography for the Global Mail. I'm talking pictures this morning with John Kadelka, who cartoons for The Australian. Welcome, John. Oh, it's good to be here, Mike. It is Melbourne Cup week, so I thought we would... Most appropriate. Appropriate. Call to, call to post that one's called, and it went off during a Joe Hockey press conference. You see when you get those, uh, when you make that presentation. <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't the last post, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> as far as the government's concerned, less is more when it comes to 
press conferences and revealing to the voters what's going on. Indeed, I have no comment on that particular <laughs> topic. <laughs> this is David Pope with Loose Lips Sinks Prime Ministerships. Uh, don't let the enemy know there's a war <laughs> don't on. Don't mention the war, yeah. indeed. And perhaps, perhaps no one will notice. The famous Kitchener uh, um, portrait from the First World War, the recruiting poster he's drawn on there. You had a similar one a few months ago, didn't you? A while back, yes. You guys just sort of recycle, recycle each other's ideas, <laughs> do. don't you? We do. We try and leave enough time in between so that pretend- nobody notices. We get together once a month and allocate jokes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I love it, the uh, super tax, the uh, enviro regulations, the mining. Yeah. Sensational. I love the mo. You should grow one of those. Yeah. yeah. Alan Moyer is definitely in the um, camp that thinks this will backfire on the government not speaking to the media. And I've got to say, he's drawing Morrison with a touch. There's a touch of the sort of Gaddafi, the early years there. I think it might be what the three-star Adderall vibe. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. He's definitely gone the asylum seeker theme here. Yeah, yeah. Sewing the lip shut. Sewing yeah. the lip shut. And um, Tony Abbott seems to have hook-like arms now. Well, the, big, the big Popeye arms, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know nothing is basically going to be the theme. <laughs> or I'm not telling anyway. Um... Mark Knight uh, um, certainly has turned Joe Hockey into from sloppy Joe into no Joe as he's uh, he's got him hammering the previous Labor uh, promises on tax reforms. Expectations lowered, I think, yesterday. Yeah. So, uh... And the bust of poor old Wayne Swan. Remember Wayne? I miss Wayne. Oh, I miss I Wayne. Who doesn't miss Wayne? I liked her on those lips. I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you? I did. Yeah. It's, it's always my favourite part of the drawing. There's no lips on the on the on the current government. You enjoy? I, I cannot. I, the the current treasurer. No one can draw him yet. Really? No, no, not after the weight loss. He's um, he's just no one's got him. Well, uh, John, the federal election's well and truly over, but there are now questions about how the West was won. Do you believe that we may be actually back in a uh, in a half senate election in Western Australia? Looking forward to it. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> this is great grist for you guys, isn't it? It's a shambles of. Uh, Oh, this topped all the previous shambles. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, it seems uh, you've uh, you've picked up on the theme of the week, the Melbourne Cup. It might be the race that stops the nation, but nothing stops you guys. We've got the uh, office sweep yeah. that stops the nation. The ticket draw, yeah. uh, and they're all pulling it out of the hat. The exciting finish, they're and they're throwing it in the their air. tickets in the yeah. air. That's the tricky part, which is uh, finding out who had the ticket. <laughs> Down on the ground. Whoops! Someone else won, and yeah. uh, and the rerun. Um, David Rowe has drawn the um, the the animal designed by a committee, the camel, and um, you have a theory on perhaps why he's drawn it like this. I think that might be his first camel's bum. I'm reasonably confident he's pretty much working. He's like Doctor Dolittle of bums, basically. He's working his way through. He can speak to bottoms. He can in a language no one else the can hear. The bottom whisperer. The bottom whisperer. David Rowe. Sorry, David. <laughs> David Pope has drawn on what you have to draw on when you're talking about spies, which is get smart. Someone, he's played the cone of silence he's card. He's played the, <laughs> the cone of silence card, and he's got um, Tony Abbott and Julie Bishop sitting there. Ah, the old people smuggling intelligence sharing review trick. <laughs> <laughs> I think he might be onto us, 99. Is that like a shoe phone? Or yeah, is that like, no, that's, 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 that's the new that's, NBN with that's, the, the, the shoelace there. It's fibre to the heel. <laughs> Well, it's a step up from tin cans anyway. As you can probably tell by my impersonation of Maxwell, I used to watch a lot of it. Smart. Yeah, might have seen a couple of episodes myself, actually. Yeah. Well, I think we've probably missed it by that much. <laughs> I'll let you do the honours and throw back to Barry. Back to you, Barry. Thanks, guys. And of course, as we mentioned before, Parliament resumes Tuesday, but it'll be mainly ceremonial. But Clive Palmer will.